Today, Spain is one of two countries on the Iberian Peninsula alongside Portugal. But in the Middle Ages, the Iberian Peninsula looked very different, with many Christian kingdoms in the north and a whole host of Muslim entities in the south. So in today's video, I want to find out why did this change and why are there now only two kingdoms, or well, one republic and one kingdom to be precise, in the Iberian Peninsula? How was Spain unified? The Iberian Peninsula was first unified under the Romans, who conquered Hispania and the various tribes and peoples that lived there. After the Roman Empire fell apart, Germanic peoples moved into the peninsula, such as the Suebi and the Visigoths, the Visigoths establishing control over the entire peninsula once again. That was until 711, when invaders from North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula crossed the Gibraltar Straits and made Spain and Portugal their own home. These are of course known to history as the Moors, from the Spanish word moros, although many other terms for them are used. And technically those that invaded were part of a much larger empire at the time, or a caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate, that stretched across much of the known world throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and now into Europe as well. They conquered the entire peninsula, easily crushing Visigothic resistance and establishing their control. But it wasn't long before the first rebellion against their rule broke out in the northern mountainous region of Asturias, which is in the Cantabrian Mountains. It's not quite sure whether the Arabs were able to fully cement their control over this area at first and that this was then a rebellion against them, or whether this region had been rebellious from the very start. But what we do know is that in 718, a battle was fought by an ousted Visigothic nobleman called Pelagius in Latin or Pelayo, a lot of the time in more modern Spanish, and that he and his forces were victorious against the Umayyad army and so were able to cement their own independence in what would become known as the Kingdom of Asturias. In more recent Spanish historiography, this event has been seen as hugely significant, the start of the Christian fight back or reconquista against the lands that had been captured by the Muslims. But in reality, this might have been a fairly small-scale rebellion. Later Arabic sources describe it as being just 16 donkeys fighting against them. And while of course this was important for Pelagius as it would establish the Kingdom of Asturias and a region in the north of the Iberian Peninsula that would remain outside of Muslim control, Control. How significant at the time this was, we don't really know. It's possible that the Arab conquerors and their Berber allies didn't see these northern mountains as being particularly important and so let it slide. Although soon after, the neighbouring region of Galicia would also rise in revolt and would join the Kingdom of Asturias, the kingdom slowly pushing south over the centuries to come. If you want to try your hand at La Reconquista and uniting Spain, or even the entire Iberian Peninsula into one kingdom, then you can with today's video sponsor, Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign. Knights of Honor is an empire building grand strategy game that runs in real time and allows you to take the helm of a host of medieval kingdoms, from Aragon to Poland to the Caliphs and Emirs of the Middle East and North Africa, and anything in between. Use political intrigue, economic planning, strategic investment, and tactical insight on the battlefield to advance your aims and rewrite the history of the Middle Ages. As opposed to other grand strategy titles which have steep learning curves, Knights of Honor makes a point out of being intuitive and accessible to new players, while at the same time providing a new spin for veterans of the genre. Think of a mix of Crusader Kings and Medieval 2 Total War, except that Knights of Honor Sovereign plays out in real time. There are no turns, so you'll have to just think on your feet and plan as you go. If this sounds like a game for you, then check out the link in the description to buy the game on Steam now and forge your medieval kingdom today. The Moors would continue their advance across the Pyrenees, setting up control over parts of what is today the south of France, at that time claimed by the Frankish Empire. In 732, a raid into northern France would be defeated by Charles Martel, the famous Battle of Tours. To stop the Moors from raiding north again, the Franks would set up several buffer states, known often as Marcha Lords or the Marca Hispanica, which is the Spanish March or Spanish border land, these semi-autonomous lords receiving backing from the Franks and officially owing loyalty to them whilst often acting quite independently. 
One of these would be set up in the area of what is today Barcelona when this was captured from Muslim forces and the Counts of Barcelona would be powerful figures in the region. Although they would become increasingly independent after 985 when Barcelona was sacked by Muslim raiders and the Frankish Empire didn't do anything to help them. And so these lords can be seen as semi-independent and they will be very important for the story later on. Not everyone was happy with this Frankish help, however, and this is exemplified in 778, when the Basques, who lived in the northern part of the Pyrenees, revolted and fought against the Franks, who had recently crushed their allies, the Aquitanians. This occurred at the Battle of Roncavaux Pass, which is famously remembered in the song The Chanson de Roland, about a Frankish knight who was killed by the Basques there. These Basques would actually ally with the Umayyad Caliphate, the Muslims who had conquered land in the south, to maintain their independence from Frankish lords and other of these marcher lords that were established in the Pyrenees border zone. And in 824, they would establish the Kingdom of Pamplona around the city of the same name, which would eventually become the Kingdom of Navarre, one of the most important states that would arise in the Iberian Peninsula. Despite their hostility to the Franks, the Kingdom of Navarre, situated in the Western Pyrenees as it was, would often be allied with and then be fighting against the Kingdom of France and the later kingdoms in Spain as well. By 910, the Kingdom of Asturias had transformed into a much more powerful entity. First, its kings would raid the Moorish possessions to the south and later they would actively conquer these regions, repopulating these buffer zones with people from Galicia, Cantabria and Asturias to resettle a new population of what would become the Spaniards of the North. It was following the death of one of their greatest kings, Alfonso, the aptly named the Great, that he divided the kingdom between his three sons into three parts, the westernmost into Galicia, the northernmost area of Asturias, and possibly the richest area of Leon, which is the area in which the kingdom would continue to expand, most of its capitals and cultural powerhouses being situated there rather than in the mountain regions where it had began. And it's roughly after this point that we start to refer instead of to a kingdom of Asturias to a kingdom of Leon, as this became the central nucleus of the kingdom and its power base. In 931, during the reign of King Ramiro II of the kingdom of Leon, they also conquered a new area that was very important an area called Burgos. This Burgos region and the larger area around it, the Germanic word Burg already denotes a mountain or a fortification. And its nickname in the Romance language that was spoken there by most of the people was Castile, which of course is related to the English word castle, as there were many fortifications and castles that had been erected in this borderland by the Moors and later also by the kings of Leon, shout out, to stop the Moors from raiding their own lands. And yet the duke that would come to power here would be very influential indeed. With so many castles, they can often act in a very autonomous manner. And this is exactly what they did, trying to create their own independent statelet away from the kingdom of Leon, something they managed to do until 966, when they were once again reunited with the original kingdom of Leon. However, it's important to note that several times throughout the next centuries, Castile would break away from Leon as some sometimes would Galicia and Asturias, as powerful counts and knights in these fortified areas could easily rebel against their overlords, and frequently those in Leon and other regions would be fighting not only against the Moors to the south, the classic image of La Reconquista, but also against each other and against those newer entities that were developing in the east of the Iberian Peninsula along the Pyrenees. And it would only be in 1230 that Leon and Castile would definitively stay together as one political entity. However, that's still in the future. Another important development would happen just about two centuries earlier in 1031. Beforehand, the, those facing the Christian kingdoms in the north were fairly united. The Muslims were strong, they were unified, and they had a technological advantage a lot of the time over their adversaries. However, in 1031, the Caliphate of Cordoba would fall, and instead it would be replaced by many, many different small states. The 
these statelets frequently being referred to by the Arabic word of taifa. These taifas would fight against one another, much like the Christian kingdoms, as well as against the Christians, and most of them would soon be forced to pay tribute or paria to the kingdoms in the north and would need external help to continue existing and fighting against their own neighbors, making the process of capturing lands to the south a lot easier for the Christians now that they were no longer fighting against a unified enemy. The Kingdom of Navarre would also be split following the death of King San Sancho III in 1035, who split the kingdom three ways for his three sons, a bit of a theme as I'm sure you'll see. One of these kingdoms that were formed from Navarre was around the city of Jaca, and it would eventually be from this part of the split kingdom of Navarre that the kingdom of Aragon would be formed after the brother that had been given this part would go on to conquer the rest. And so for a time you had uh, the fact that you both the kingdom of Navarre and what would become the kingdom of Aragon were being ruled together from Aragon. Although this situation changed in 1135 when they once again split. So you had a separate kingdom of Navarre in the north and a kingdom of Aragon further to the southeast. Now a very important development development in the history of Aragon would be in 1162, when the line of the Counts of Barcelona, so those marcher lords that had initially been installed by the Franks but had really been acting independently for several centuries, married into the House of Aragon. And so the Counts of Barcelona also became the Kings of Aragon. And this became known as the Crown of Aragon, and it would become the second most powerful entity in the Iberian Peninsula before very long. And by about 1285, they would have conquered much of the Mediterranean coast of Spain from the various Moorish taifas that they encountered, as well as taking lands from Navarre and crossing over the other side of the Pyrenees into what is today France. And so by 1285, the map of the Iberian Peninsula starts to look very different with several very large kingdoms emerging emerging in the north and the Muslims being pushed further and further south. Indeed, the Kingdom of Navarre also spread outside of Spain. I already mentioned they went on the other side of the Pyrenees. They also crossed to several of the islands, of course, the Balearic Islands off the Spanish coast, but also to Sicily and uh, to some of the other Italian islands and the Italian mainland, and sometimes even holding lands uh, across into what is today Greece. More on that and the spread of the Catalan language into parts of these Italian islands and further in my video on the languages of Spain where I mention a lot of the linguistic history of these kingdoms as well. But anyway, back to the history. In 1139, an important point to also mention is that one of the counts that had been Count of Portugal, Afonso Henriques, after winning an important battle, would declare himself independent from the Kingdom of Leon and so form the Kingdom of Portugal, which would be recognized by the Pope as a separate Christian kingdom. And so Portugal would split off from that large entity of uh, Castile and Leon as it would be forming. But then, how do we end up, these are our major players in the game, but how do we end up with a single unified kingdom of Spain, having now got rid of Portugal? Well, that's for the next part of this video. Let's start around 1400, when we can see that the map of the Iberian Peninsula looks rather different than it did at the start. We have in the centre the largest and most powerful of the kingdoms, Castile and Leon, which have finally been solidly merged and has expanded southwards at a rapid pace, conquering many of the Muslim taifas. We have its next door neighbour, the second largest and second most powerful entity, Aragon, which is actually, this is only the very western part of that empire, it's also spread across other parts of the Mediterranean. We also have uh, in the very west, we have the Kingdom of Portugal, which is a separate and independent kingdom, soon to embark on its own voyages of exploration. To the south, the final of the Muslim kingdoms, Granada, is held and is paying tribute to the Kingdom of Castile and Leon. And in the very north along the Pyrenees, we have the Kingdom of Navarre, which at this point is entangled with the French kingdom as well, but is still independent from Castile and Leon. So how do we end up with a unified state? 
Well, the catalyst for this is the death in 1410 of the last of the House of Barcelona as the rulers of the Kingdom of Aragon. And two years later, they elected a Castilian prince to become the new King of Aragon. Now, this was something, uh, he was Ferdinand of Castile, and this decision was something that greatly upset the Catalan nobles, because of course they had been the ones who had held the power in Aragon, being the Counts of Barcelona for the longest time. And now they had suddenly been dispossessed, causing friction in the Kingdom of Aragon, particularly across the border with Castile and Leon, as they feared that they might be trying to take over. Now this situation was somewhat resolved in 1469 with the marriage of the two heirs of the various kingdoms. On the one hand you had Ferdinand who was a descendant of the previous Ferdinand of Castile who was the ruler of Aragon and he married Isabella of Castile, so the daughter of the ruler of the king in Castile at that time. They would have to fight other claimants for the Castilian throne, but in 1479 they would emerge victorious and be called by the Pope Los Reyes Católicos, meaning the Catholic monarchs. And these are often cited as being this point in history is often cited as being the start of the Spanish monarchy of a single unified Spanish state. They're quite famous for several things and important for this video is in 1492 when the Emirate or the, the, the last state in Granada capitulated. The last Muslim holding in the Iberian Peninsula was taken over by the joint forces of Ferdinand and Isabella. However, what's important for this video is that this wasn't actually the start of a unified Spain as while there were now joint monarchs, one king ruling Aragon and the queen ruling Castile and Leon, they did still rule individually each kingdom. Their legal systems had not been merged, for example. And that's rather important because it means that they weren't ruling Spain, they were ruling Castile and Leon on the one hand and Aragon on the other. Following Isabella's death in 1504, there was a great amount of unrest at the prospect that Ferdinand would become the sole ruler of both Aragon and Castile, although eventually he did this in effect, while in name only their daughter Joanna would become the queen in Castile, although she was generally regarded to be mad and so she wasn't allowed to rule and instead was locked away. However, one person would come to rule both, and that was in 1516, when the husband of Joanna, a certain Charles V or I, as Charles was also the Holy Roman Emperor, ruling over the vast Habsburg lands, as well as now being the King of Castile and Leon and Aragon too. And this would be the case for his descendants too, so they would be ruling over both. However, it's important to remember that the legal systems and the technical jurisdictions of both kingdoms would remain intact. There would also be some regional differences and in rebellions to come. So for example, in 1640, Catalonia would would rebel and side with the French, perhaps again going back to that older connection across the Pyrenees with the Frankish Empire and connections of language too against the Spaniards in a war. But this would change in 1700. And this is important because it was in this year that the Spanish king died without a clear heir. And this would of course kickstart the War of Spanish Succession. What's in a name? Following this war, it was made clear by the victorious allies that while the French king would be able to go and rule in Spain, this, he would not be allowed to merge the kingdoms of France and Spain together. You could rule one, but you couldn't rule both. A power block that would be far too powerful for the Protestant nations in the north to be allowed to exist. And it was under the reign of the new Bourbon king in Spain that in 1707 and all the way through to 1715, various decrees would be issued that would bring the kingdom together. These are called in Spanish, Los Decretos de Nueva Planta. And in English, these are the decrees of Nueva Planta. And what these would essentially do is to merge the legal and jurisdictional domains of both Castile and Leon and Aragon together and so bring to an end the crowns, the separate crowns and so to start with a centralized monarchy of all of Spain. 
Note that Navarre at this th point still had, but it was from this point on that Castile would be the cultural heartland of Spain rather than Aragon, and so it was on the Castilian model that the court system would be imposed on the rest of Spain as well as its language. And so Castilian Spanish would be the only language of the courts and official documentation, displacing Catalan as it was used in the Kingdom of Aragon. Uh, eventually it would also displace Basque in the region of Navarre and Latin, which was still used in quite a few areas as well. Uh, so this is a very important point in the unification of Spain. But whilst this was a legal unification of Spain and a creation of a Spanish state, culturally it might not have happened overnight. And many people probably still associated themselves with their various region and in Aragon with their kingdom that had gone. Now the turning point possibly for when this sort of culturally and on a more social level might have changed could have been in 1808 when France invaded Spain during the Napoleonic Wars. And it's during this war often called the Spanish War of Independence when Spain suffered greatly at the hands of France and in the uh, future Peninsula War when the British would also become involved that perhaps an idea of a Spanish state and being a Spaniard as opposed to being French might have come into full focus and might have brought people together under a single national banner rather than harking back to the old kingdoms of Leon and Galicia, Asturias and Aragon. Although that is just my suggestion and if you know more about Spanish nationalism and its origins feel free to comment in the comment section below. Another interesting point is that this might already have happened before 1808 in the New World, where many liberal Spaniards are known to have gone and to have settled in particularly South America, where these, these nation states would also rebel against central Spanish rule and thus create new identities with their own nations there as well. But having said that, it's not entirely clear that this idea of being a, a Spaniard, the central Spanish state, is that rooted everywhere in Spain? Many people no doubt do feel Spanish, but even today there is quite a strong regional identity. This could be seen, for example, following the Spanish Civil War in 1939, when the strongly nationalist uh, group that took over power with Francisco Franco would insist on the strengthening of this national character rather than the regional character that had been manifested in these kingdoms around about. And we know that there are several groups and in some places incredibly strong, such as the Basques with ETA and also with the more democratic movements in Catalonia that are seeking to gain their own independence as independent nation states away from centralized Spain. And they often will go back to this period of kingdoms when there were separate groups and separate kingdoms in Spain and say, look, this is our historical historical backing for an independent state that has just as much right to exist as a centralized Spanish state. But of course, I don't want to get too much into the modern politics in this video, but just to say that this topic is still very much alive for some people in Spain and may yet be very important in the future. But anyway, for now, that has been an incredibly long video on the uh, unification of Spain going through some of this period that is often called La Reconquista but really um, is a bit of an oversimplified term in my view but I thought nonetheless it was a very interesting video to do. I think this yeah this will be the last video up before Christmas so I hope everyone uh, is having a nice festive time and will enjoy uh, this time of year however you choose to spend it. Um, I hope this has been an interesting video. I'm thinking about maybe doing a video on La Reconquista itself and seeing whether it's a, a useful term in uh, historiography and looking back at the past or whether it invokes the, the wrong kind of image and oversimplifies things too much. Let me know in the comments below if you're interested uh, and I will see you all again very soon. And don't forget to check out Knight Sovereign. That would be awesome. All right, everyone, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.